Good morning. Derek Watson, the angry dentist here. Friday the 3rd of the 3rd. Just picked up the papers and it's raining. <coughs> Excuse me. Actually, it's nice to have a bit of rain. I haven't had some rain for a while. But uh, it's just, uh, I've just uh, trimmed the hedge a couple of weeks ago and cut the grass for the first time. And we're starting to get to the point where um, there's more jobs to do in the garden, you know. I work uh, Monday to Friday. Don't work at weekends. Used to. Used to work Saturday morning. My advice don't work weekends. My, my surgery hours for many years were 8.45 to 1. Staff used to come in at 8, uh, 8 8.30. So they, they had like 15 minutes to set up and then we had the first patient in at 8.45. Then we used to work through till 1. Then we had like a half an hour off about half past 10 in case anyone rang up with a real emergency so we had some time to fit them in. If not, then we, you know, we could overrun a bit or um, have a have a you know half hour tea break, coffee break, or whatever. And then we used to work from two till five thirty. Uh, so, yeah, so the surgery hours were not they were not bad, you know, quarter to nine to five thirty as far as patients are concerned. There was a bit of scope for them to come in the morning if. Um, they wanted to sort of get into work a bit late, but not much massively late, you know. Um, no scope at all for them to pop out lunchtime, um, and but also quite good scope for them to come after work. And of course, then you've got the kids that come from sort of 3:30 to 5:30 because they're just coming out of school. The Saturday morning I found was really uh, not worth it, you know. There are two times when, when somebody, we had two patients fail to turn up yesterday. Perhaps I think that's that, I mean that's, I was gonna to talk to you a bit about nurses, perhaps I'll do that tomorrow. The two patients failed to turn up, and in both cases, they, they had the same sort of defining factors. Now we are quite careful to make sure our patients turn up because we have far fewer patients I'd imagine the most surgeries and so we've just got more time to give them a ring and saying you know you haven't forgotten your appointment tomorrow have you etc etc uh, our, our typical patient who doesn't turn up is someone who came in uh, with a, a single issue you know because they had a crown fall off or they had a pain and they needed a root treatment on the spot etc one of these patients um, I mean in hindsight, it was pretty obvious that she wasn't going to come in because uh, she'd come in, uh, funnily enough, she'd come in because she was a direct referral for hygiene. She'd been told that she couldn't have any treatment done until she got her gums sorted out and so she needed to see a hygienist. And they didn't have a hygienist at the practice and for some reason the dentist decided he didn't want to dirty his hands doing hygiene. So he decided to uh, tell her that he wouldn't see her. I don't know, I mean, that's a weird story. I don't really think it, it happened exactly like that, but that's the story we got. And um, anyway, she came to see us and we did our routine exam on her and, and including some bite wings and found out that she had a grossly carious upright five. So I ended up root treating it for her on the spot, which is the best way to do it if, if everyone's happy with that. And um, put a big, uh, temporary filling in and um, she didn't come back to have it filled you know restored and that was it as I say single issue but the reason why and you're saying well of course you know that you know, why, why would she come back for a checkup after not having not come back for the filling and the answer is that um, when she was sent a recall she acknowledged the recall and in fact she even asked for the date to be changed slightly because it wasn't convenient and then confirmed that she was coming in and then uh, just didn't turn up and these just didn't turn up the JDTUs are uh, annoying you know I mean uh, frustrating you know it's a waste of surgery time really expensive surgery time I don't think and of course you try and ring them and uh, they never answer the phone they're always like oh that's probably the dentist on the phone I'm not going to pick that up 
and um, sometimes we have a bit of success if they have genuinely forgotten by sending them an SMS. If we send an SMS and it generally has to be done around 10 minutes after they've failed so don't sort of send them one later. We have a policy with patients who fail or don't turn up on time. We, we ring them up, we try and get in touch with them and we say look you know it's not a big deal we all forget things but if, if you can come in today then we'll see you you know just come just come in and um, because this sorts the wheat out from the chaff the ones who are have definitely stood you up and have got no intention of coming in will say oh look I'm really sorry um, you know uh, my uh, I've got a flat tire on the car etc and, and there's no way I'm gonna be able to come in today. I'll have to ring you, ring you back and reschedule. They never reschedule. They all say, oh, I'll have to give you a ring. Um, the ones who are genuinely have overslept will say, yeah, 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 that's great. If you could, I'll, I'll get dressed and I'll come straight in. So you know they're genuine. They're the ones you, you sort of look after. We, um, I mean, you can be just as uh, apologetic to them and say, oh, sorry to hear about the flat tire on your car. That's a, that's a real shame because you know you will get charged the same whether you come in or not because it costs us the same you know we've got the, the nurses are all standing around the surgeries um, uh, is reserved for you um, you know this is like a bespoke booking and so you'll you know from your point of view if you come in at least you won't get charged for doing the job and not get the job done now so that, uh, again, that can focus their minds a bit when they realise that, in fact, whether they come in or not, they're going to get the same amount of money, liability. Of course, you can charge patients till you're blue in the face. They don't have to pay it. I mean, in, in practice, it's, it's impractical to take anyone to small claims to get any money back. So when you say, oh, well, uh, you know, obviously, there'll be a failed appointment charge equivalent to the cost of your checkup or equivalent to the cost of whatever you know was booked um, they'll um, they'll hang up and you'll never get the money and you'll never pursue the money um, but the point is you've got to the point where, where you don't want that patient anymore you don't want a patient that hangs up on you and just decides on the day that they don't want to come in and therefore it saves you the embarrassment of uh, saying to them, don't darken my doorstep again, you know. So, the, the charge is, the FTA charge or whatever you want to call it, fail to attend charge, is really just a way of putting an obstacle in their way if they decide to come back. So if they do decide to come back, then at least you've got the, the very, in a very rare occasion where they, they will at least pay for the privilege of um, getting back into the booking uh, yeah so and the two times that patients that you know I wouldn't say I think you probably have a slightly higher failure rate on a Saturday or in the evening uh, but it certainly hurts more you know if you are giving up your Saturday morning to see a patient and they don't turn up uh, really you are you know you you do sit there thinking what is the meaning of life you know why, why am I <laughs> bothering to do this um, it, it upsets you more it affects you more you know my weekends the problem with my weekends were that uh, I worked Saturday morning and I was already tired because I'd, I'd worked you know I mean if you you're gonna get to the surgery for quarter to nine you may have a commute you could I mean I try and keep my commute down to about uh, half an hour 20 minutes max as you know, um, you, you know, some dentists have a commute of an hour, and then so so they're leaving at 7:30, and then you're finishing at 5:30. Perhaps you've got to do a bit of paperwork. You're home at seven. You do that five days a week. But Friday evening, you're already completely cream crackered. Saturday morning, you're you're doing it all again. Patients are not turning up, etc. Um, and then what happens is you go home Saturday lunchtime, you fall asleep in the chair, and uh, then you wake up and then you try and perhaps make something of the Saturday and then spend all day Sunday thinking, well, tomorrow I'm back at work. 
So it's not much of an existence, you know, and uh, I used to think, oh, well, no, no, we need to provide this service because people are there at work themselves and they can't come during the week, but they can. They, I mean, they can, you know. Um, the ones that can't uh, will have to go to someone younger than me at the moment, I think, who can work a Saturday. And it was the same with the evenings, you know, we used to work, we used to do an evening surgery. Well, what do you do with an evening surgery? Let's say you want to open till eight, all right, which is probably realistically the earliest you want to close if you're, if you are working an evening. Um, and you're starting at uh, 8.30, 8.45. So you're working pretty well 11 hours on the trot. You can't, there's no point starting at 10 and working through till 8 because uh, you've lost the two hours. The two hours you've gained, you've immediately lost. So you've, uh, you know, you've sort of given yourself two productive hours and taken two away. And then, um, so, so in the middle of your five-day week and your Saturday morning, you're, you're now working a 12-hour day. And, and again, if somebody doesn't turn up, it's soul-destroying. Especially if it, like, you've got a crown booked in at 7. And you think, oh, that's good, I'll get that squared away by 7.30, 7.45 and, and I'll be off. At 7.15, the patient hasn't turned up. So what do you do? I mean, I must admit, on more than one occasion, We've turned the lights off and hidden behind the desk. <laughs> if the patient has turned up. But that's no good, is it? That's no good for the patient. The patient's harassed, they've been delayed. You're not gonna do the work, you're not gonna get the money. I mean, <clears throat> it's not much of an existence. So, uh, and then, so then what do you do? The patient then, you ring them and you say, you know, did you know you, you've got a dental appointment? Oh my God, don't, I'll be straight down. They don't get there till 7.30. And so you're there till half past eight, you know, you've got to keep all the staff on, they're upset, <clears throat> you're upset, stress, tensed. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so my advice is leave it to the larger surgeries that have more practitioners to do the shifts. You know, they can do, they can do sort of uh, eight till four or 12 till eight. <coughs> Excuse me. So, where was I? Nurses. Now, I qualified in 81, went to work in 82, so I'm sort of I'm firmly embedded in the old system of fee for item. A good system, a good system. Combined with effective enforcement, policing, inspection, detection, etc. Uh, an inspector that we really sort of respected and feared because they were uh, they knew what they were talking about they were all ex-dentists and the inspectorate was dentists and local dentists as well and even if you thought you could fool a dentist from out the area there's not much chance of fooling a dentist from uh, from within a 10 mile radius we all knew who the goodies and the baddies were you used to get paid per filling uh, paid per checkup and paid per scale and polish and the thing about the old DEB or the Dental Practice Board as it became was that um, someone would say, well, you know, I've, I've done a filling but I've put in a dentine retention pin and I think I should be paid for that. So they bring in a, pi a fee for the dentine retention reten pin and then people like uh, Kevin Lewis made their name going up and down the country saying, oh, uh, listen guys, you can claim for all these fees. All this, this is the way he sold it. He said, all this stuff you're doing for nothing, you can claim for all this. There's fees for all this. They're hidden, but you know, they exist. And so there became this sort of industry in um, trying to explain to dentists what uh, they could claim. And uh, there was no, um, there's no suggestion of impropriety. These were actual fees that you could claim. And the DPB didn't want to publicize them because uh, as far as they were concerned, all the time the dentists were doing it for nothing, it was great. And there was a short-lived uh, campaign under the new UDA system by, I think, uh, Cruz and and the other Watson, no relation, 
to try, try and tell people how to uh, maximise income under the new UDA system. Um, and, the, and the academics call it gaming. Apparently making money, <laughs> operating a contract that they have full control over and that they invented and that they set the terms for is gaming. They don't like it. They, they, it's gaming is a cipher for cheating in their eyes. Anyway, uh, a dentist who uh, did a checkup almost always did a scan and polish, and almost always the patient needed it, so it wasn't a big deal. But then uh, the, uh, the the bean counters at the DPB decided that uh, one of the ways they could cut down on funding would be to try and reduce the number of scan and polishes, which they thought were being tacked on unnecessarily, you know, that you, you just, and there was a name for it, it was called Biro Dentistry, because it, you used to fill in the form saying what you did, and it, and it became quite easy to tick the boxes, you know, and say, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, I did one of them, did one of them, and of course there's no way they could tell. They used to ask the patients if they'd had X, Y, and Z done, but the patients are hopeless at remembering what they'd had done, so it wasn't really uh, a forensic uh, way of investigating it. So, the um, but then we all had hygienists, and hygienists used to do scaling and polishing. Um, but then they decided that you know, not not only did they not want a six monthly checkup for everyone, they didn't want certainly didn't want six monthly scaling and polishing for everyone. And so they uh, started cutting back quite severely on the fees for scaling and polishing. And funnily enough, this had the the inverse effect that was required. So you might think, well, they reduce the fee for something, then less of it's going to get done. But in fact, what happened was they reduced the fee to below what was necessary for the patient to see a hygienist. So the dentist then couldn't afford to refer the patient to the hygienist for their hygiene treatment. And so the dentist started doing it himself. In the moment, after all, the patient was in the chair and the um, you know, and he had and the patient had their mouth open, and he was only going to get a couple of quid for doing a scale and polish. So, why not do it? And so, obviously, the quality of the work went down. The amount of time that the patients were given went down. And but the only thing that didn't go down was the number of scale and polishes. So, but the, and the cost uh, of providing them went down so, uh, to match the fact that the fee had gone down. And this is a the story of the National Health Service since I qualified. It's been a downward spiral of attempts to try and um, in introduce what are seen as efficiencies through this sort of centralised uh, Soviet style of micromanagement from Whitehall, uh, every one of which has, has produced a concomitant downturn in quality um, of the treatment that's provided on the National Health Service. Anyway, um, then along comes uh, direct access, the idea being that uh, the, the theory was that patients who went to the dentist more frequently ended up with more treatment. And the dentist profession is like, well, duh, yeah, you know, <laughs> patients who come in regularly get, get their teeth fixed and those who don't, don't get them fixed, so this, the numbers are lower. Of fillings provided on patients who don't come in, and um, but on you know in academia this was uh, sort of taken up by people like uh, Shyam, who said you know we've got to we've got to keep these pa patients out of the dentist. We've got to stop them going in there because they're they're like uh, you know swimming in a pool with a shark. The dentist got all the advantages he knows. He's got the lingo, he's got the patter, he's got the, the uh, on their back with their mouth open where they can't argue. And so they bring in direct access where <clears throat> the theory was that um, hygienists could set up on their own and we would have little hygiene surgeries where they would be sitting there and they wouldn't need a dentist. They could just sit there and patients could ring up, oh, is that the hygiene shop? Yeah, come in. <clears throat> would you like a scale and polish? Yeah, we're here fine. Oh, and by the way, 
um, we'll do a checkup. We will. We'll, we'll have a look around just in case you've got oral cancer. Not that we're trained to recognise oral cancer, but hopefully, if we do see oral cancer, we'll we will we'll sort of recognise it without being trained to recognise it, and then so you won't end up being disadvantaged by not going to see someone who can do your proper checkup. And we, we we had a direct access hygienist. Oh, she was very. Oh, she was very proud of the fact she was direct access hygienist. Not at all uh, phased by the fact that she was working in a, um, you know, in a dental surgery with a dentist and the full supporting staff, and no need to worry about paying the wages or negotiating the lease or. Uh, oh no, but no, direct. You know, direct. Anyone, just anyone, rings up and asks for me, book them in. and um, don't need to see a dentist. But then, when the patients came in, because we don't charge for a checkup anyway for, for a new patient, and we would say to them, you know, do you want, would you like, while you're here, it doesn't cost you anything, would you like us to do a checkup? And they'll go, yeah, all right then. So the, the, this idea that there's a whole bunch of patients out there that are just, you know, raring to get into the hygienist on a cosmetic basis and, and don't want to have to go through the dentist as a gatekeeper, um, to get to the hygienist is, is proved to be a totally damp squib. And and uh, I'm just going to wrap up by saying that I think the funniest thing is that uh, what, what it's done is it's bred a load, a bunch of patients, a generation of patients, who, who think that the hygienist is sort of above the dentist in terms of periodontal treatment. And they were like, oh, you know, well... Um, you know, Mr. Watson can can do a scan and polish for you today, or would you rather come back and see the hygienist? Oh, I'd rather come back and see the hygienist. Why is that? Oh, well, she's a specialist, isn't she? No. <laughs> she's a hygienist. <laughs> you know, it always amazes me. They rather, you know, like, oh, oh you've come to have your portrait painted. Uh, would you like to wait for the, for the jobbing portrait painter or would you like to see Mr Da Vinci? Oh no, I want to see the jobbing portrait painter, please. <laughs> anyway, okay, so hygienists, you've got to love them, haven't you? You've got to love them. They do their best. But don't forget what I said. If you're a hygienist, you're listening to this, which you probably aren't by now. Plot control, throw the electric toothbrush out the window. Show them how to brush, give them the brush, give them some disclosing tablets. If that fails, give them an interspace brush, disclose them again. And if all else fails, tell them they'll be on basic fillings and, and extractions until such time as their plaque control improves. The punishment beatings will continue <laughs> until their plaque improves. Okay, that's enough. I've gone over time today. I'm off to work. See you tomorrow. Bye.